All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, we're all set up. Hello, my name is Maxwell Bernstein. I am the editor of Fermilab Superconducting Quantum Material Systems Center, and we are one of five national quantum centers. We are researching quantum computing and finding applications to the devices we are creating to do, to do physics and sensing and all sorts of other really cool stuff that these two scientists are going to talk about. Doha, do you want to introduce Hello. yourself? I am, I am Doha, Doha Trichol. Um, I am research associate at Fermilab. I work on theory and algorithms of uh, what we are going to discuss today. Yes. Hi guys, I'm Mick. I'm also a postdoc at Fermilab. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I also work in the algorithms trust in the new SQMS center. And right now we are in the industrial building at Fermilab's campus. Um, do you guys mind explaining what these big orange tubes are? Or I can start from this. Actually, yeah, what are these? What are these on this table? So this is basically really a cavity. Mm -hmm. um, so there's going to be a transmon. Um, what's a trans what's a transmon? Transmon is a qubit mm -hmm. that can um, that can have two levels or to, to more than actually actually have two levels. But the thing is like um, the quantization of the qubit and the electrical field inside the uh, cavity are different mm -hmm. so um <clears throat> so in cavity you have electrical fields and magnetic fields mm -hmm. which are oscillating at very um high, high frequencies and then uh, the trick is like uh, you can use a transform coupled to this electrical field to control the um control the electrical field and the uh, mode of modes of the electrical fields and the modes of the qubits so that you can do all, all kinds of cool stuff for instance, you can use them to um, for quantum computing. For instance, an alternative way to, for, for quantum computing. Um, one way to do this is um, use them as particle accelerators, so that we can use them. Uh, the ultimate goal here is to use them to detect axion particles. So the axion particle is basically what is, it is thought to be. Um, is thought to um, give rise to uh, dark matter. So the, uh, actually, the um, uh, the main idea is quite simple. There's going to be an electrical field oscillating inside. So imagine that two ends are um, two, two ends are open. If the particle it, uh, enters there with the correct re correct frequency or correct mass, it is going to be accelerated to the other side. So of course, this is not going to be only single cell. There's going to be a multi cell. That, that's the main experiment that we are, that we are trying to do. So. This is for this is so, for multi single cell, and this is for multi cell. So what are these? So what exactly are these? What is a particle accelerator? First off, so in here it looks like we have these components for particle accelerators. But what is a particle accelerator exactly? Well, if they're in the name, an accelerate particles. And what are they? So, what are they used for? They're used for all sorts of high energy physics experiments. A lot of these experiments, well, physics is not very well understood at at all, really, at high energies and low energies. Um, and from a complicated combination of field theory and general relativity, it's a lot easier to observe these sort of exotic phenomena um, at very, very high speeds. So we need these particle accelerators to accelerate particles to the fractions of a, or fractions of a difference between the speed and the, the speed of the particles and the speed of light. So yeah, we're part of the SQMS Center. Um, Fermilab itself, you know, has quite a strong history of or a lot of strengths when it comes to superconducting cavities and accelerators in general. And our one of our centers, one of the well, our center, which is one of the five EOE quantum centers, I think it was signed into law in like 2019 or something. Um, we are trying to leverage a lot of the existing superconducting knowledge and cavity knowledge here at Fermilab to do dark matter searches, like though I said, but also to build, um, consider, and investigate various types of quantum computers. And so these cavities, which you which you saw earlier, uh, we were hoping to be able to use them as the basis for a future quantum computer housed right here at, at Fermilab. So I do not believe we introduced David Van Zatten to the, I, I believe we forgot to introduce him. David, do you mind introducing you. yourself and telling telling what you do? Yeah, sure, I will. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is David Van Zanten. I work as a research um, scientist, associate a scientist. Um, at Fermilab in the SQMS department, um, I'm working with uh, these cavities that you've seen here and transmon qubits, and I try to uh, integrate them together to basically make a quantum computer that is uh, not really level, like based on qubits, but more on qubits. 
So maybe I can just take this opportunity straight away about what the connection precisely is between these cavities uh, that are used for SRF or, or particle physics accelerators and quantum, because that's obviously not trivial because you see the red tube there and the orange tube there on the background. They're awfully big, right? And uh, of course, uh, you know, the particles that are being accelerated through there, they're very small, but this is not your typical picture of a quantum computer. And it is not a quantum computer. But the corresponding factor is that to have these high energies on these particles and to accelerate them that strongly, the fields inside these cavities need to be very long lived. So think about this as sort of harmonic, like a swing or harmonic oscillator. We also refer to this as a swing. Um, now we give the swing a little bit of a motion and then it will oscillate around its, uh, around its fixture point with a certain natural frequency, right? I think you all, guys, you all know this. Um, <clears throat> now, the longer that the swing does this, the better your acceleration field is. So the stronger your, your particle accelerator becomes. And the same thing actually holds as well for quantum devices, right? Because we want to store quantum information actually inside the motional, or, uh, motional quantum states of these cavities. So the longer that that quantum state lives, so the longer that that swing stays oscillating, keeps oscillating, the longer our qubit is alive. So, and you might have heard that one of the metrics for qubits is actually a lifetime or relaxation rate, also referred to as a T1 time. And that is actually the time over which a qubit loses its energy. The higher that time, the better your qubit. So that's just a little bit of a con like the relation between why we are using SRF cavity technology. And mostly that's very much focused on the geometry of these kind of cavities and the material science behind it. So we're utilizing that, or we're basically building further on that to make a quantum computer. And we're not, I'm not a, I'm not a um, accelerator uh, physics guy. <laughs> I'm a quantum physicist. So we're going to show you guys our quantum computing lab right now. Um, this, is where, this is where the magic happens for, for quantum computing. We have some, some scientists working right now. And we have this really interesting device here. Doha, do you mind explaining, or David? Uh, yeah, actually, the David could be more helpful David, you, because the David is working on the experiments side of, of this. So David, so what, exactly, what exactly is this large gold device in front of us? Yeah, so the whole thing together is called the dilution refrigerator. Um, and uh, this, is the, this is the tool that allows us to cool down materials to about 15 millikelvin above absolute zero. I'm unfortunately a European, so I cannot really express that in Fahrenheit, um, but you know the Kelvin scale, so I bet that you will survive. So this is just a gigantic refrigerator and it takes about, uh, it consumes about 15 kilowatt uh, in terms of energy. So it's pretty significant. What you do not see here right now are just cans. We call them cans. These are shields. We, we have, I think, four uh, mounting points for shields, four different shields. We, uh, they go concentrically on top of each other and we use that to close off this can. To close off the can, I think you're going to a fridge that is indeed now actually being used. So there you can see the outer shield. That's actually a special shield. I can come up, come back to that. But inside, we pump it down to vacuum at room temperature, and then we start to basically introduce. We start to uh, the dilution, the pre-cooling loop, which allows us to cool it down to four Kelvin, and then finally we have a dilution loop, and that dilution loop allows us to um, cool it down to 15 milli Kelvin. Now, to be honest, these these refrigerators, they are very interesting for old school um, condensed matter physicists. Uh, I'm still one of those, I think. Um, but nowadays, uh, Blue Force and Oxford, these are two companies. I'm sorry for the commercials. There are different companies as well, like Janus, a bunch of them. So, um, but they give you basically just a push button operation of these cryostats. So anybody can operate them without any problem. So if you can now go back to the cryostat that is still open, The only difficulty that an experimentalist actually faces is to mount your sample properly onto one of those golden plates. So the higher golden plates that you see, uh, they are actually hot. You do not want to put your sample there. They are uh, about 50 millikelvin. The next one is about four millikelvin. Uh, sorry, 50 kelvin. The next one is about four kelvin. Then there's another one about roughly one kelvin. There's another one about 100 millikelvin. But you want to put your sample all the way down to the one that is at 10 millikelvin. Right, that's, so that's, David, here where we have this one cell, we're going to eventually hang that nine cell cavity from here on the bottom, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. Well, we will dimension down that nine cell cavity to a little sure. bit that fits a little bit better. A little yes. bit smaller so it fits, yeah. Yes, correctly. And the idea is that that nine cell cavity is actually not one, ju not just one swing, right? Uh, that is actually nine swings. So we are encoding quantum information in nine swings simultaneously. Um, sure, but now, we can't just use nine swings. We need also a transmon, right, to help them to interact and to talk to one another. I think we've got um, a qubit on one of these silicon rods here around the corner, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it, see it too well because it's so small that we'll try and show you with the cameras. Yeah, so w while Nick is doing that, I can try to explain this. This goes a little bit further than introductionary quantum mechanics, I think. But perhaps in the book of Griffiths, he does discuss that if you take a harmonic oscillator and you now put a driving magnetic or electromagnetic field on the harmonic oscillator, if you if you are in harmonic oscillator, it's actually encoded. So this is the silicon that you can see, and you cannot see actually the device that is. On you the won't screen. see it. It's right here on the tip, but it's really tiny. Yeah, you, you don't really see it. You gotta believe us. So that <laughs> on that tip, there sits a, a transmon. So the reason why we use that is that if we try to drive our cavity, so our swings, then what we're doing is not so much exciting just one photonic state. So you know that a quantum mechanical model of, a, of an oscillator actually has these number states, right? Where N is actually a number operator and it and goes in the number or represents the number of photons that is inside the cavity. Our job is to make superpositions of those number states. Now, we cannot do that just by driving that cavity because, or that swing, because then we do not generate just one superposition. We actually generate what's co called a coherent state, which is a superposition that has a Poissonian distribution. So I know that this is a, a lot, but I think this is part of introductionary quantum mechanics. Um, so I think that it could resonate with you. So sure. what we do actually is that we don't directly drive that cavity. What we do is that we use the transmon to introduce a nonlinearity. That, was, that is what we call it. We, we introduce a nonlinearity in the cavity. You know, probably also from your quantum mechanics course that a harmonic oscillator is called harmonic because the elements, the capacitance and the inductor in the oscillator are linear elements. So if we make one of them nonlinear or if we drive, if we make some nonlinearity in the system, then actually so the levels are not equidistant anymore. So we can utilize that, that property. Yeah, so each of these here, yeah, guys, this is what we call a nine cell. It's a lot of our colleagues work on it here. Each of these you can view as being the swing or the harmonic oscillator. And to get them to interact and talk to one another, we use this transmon qubit, which is this little thing that you can't really see on the tip of the silicon rod over here. Yes, correct. There are some complexities here. Our life is not that simple, but yes, this is essentially sure. the, the, the way of how we do it. Yeah. And, and then you put the transmon to one of the ants. Up there, right? Oh, you put the transmon. So maybe actually a little bit further on the table, you see uh, one of the devices that we actually use because that one, on the, the big one on the table, that's I think a one gigahertz cavity. So that has cavity modes that are around one gigahertz. And that's actually a little bit too low in terms of frequency, because we cannot cool down our Christ that, that, that far. Like 20, 10 milli K is still too hot for us not to excite any thermal, not to excite higher levels or yeah, these fog states uh, using uh, thermal energy. So that is actually a cavity that's not so suitable directly. But I think there later on the table, a little bit further on the table, there is one. Which one? Uh, with the copper attached to it. Which one? On the right. other side of the table, I'm seeing it. Oh, this one. That one, correct. That one actually is the one that we are currently, uh, or its little brother slash sister is the one that we're actually currently measuring in the, in the dilution refrigerator on the right. So what you can see here is the, the small cavity. So it's smaller. It's only single cell referred to. It has these two pipes that go linear up and down or straight up and down. There's copper clamps on it to thermalize it well so that we can bring it real, really well down to, to 10 milli K. And then you see actually two of these circular cylinders on top and on the bottom, and those we call flanges. So the qubit is actually that little silicon rod that Nick showed you earlier is actually part of that flange. It sticks out on the flange and it goes, it protrudes into the cavity all the way into that circular um, shape in the center of the cavity. And that is where the electromagnetic field lives. Show the rest of the lab. Show the, yes. show the rest of the lab. Yeah. Hold on a second. We're going to flip this camera around. So we're going to show you guys the, um, the heavy assembly building. 
And we're also going to show you our dilution refrigerator in our heavy assembly building. We're gonna show the, the CD, like where the CDF detector, which is a big detector at Fermilab, part of Fermilab's Kevitron. And recently it made a big measurement for the W boson. The mass of the W boson was a little heavier than that, that, that comprise our universe. There was a measurement that showed that, that this W boson is a little different than, than what's expected. Um, and so we'll show you the, the building where the CDF detector is. Um, and we'll also, um, yeah, we'll show you our office space. Yeah, we'll just give you a tour of, of SQMS, I guess, but we're gonna be walking the assembly building. Um, this is where we work. This is called the Illinois Accelerator Research Center. And this is where we work. This is our office space. Here's a, here's a little sculpture. And I think you could see a little farther over there that we actually have bison. <laughs> yeah, there's bison here. We have a, a herd of bison. So. And. Wilson Hall in the distance. This is our um, this is our main building here at Fermilab. Yeah, if you see it in the distance. There. Yes. Let's get out of this rain. The connection currently is not Unless great. Let's read book. And a hot cup of tea. Hot cup of tea yeah. What was that? The connection currently is not the greatest, just to inform you. It was the world's most powerful particle collider, and then. I think what we're going to see is truly one of the most amazing things uh, for me as a physicist, as a condensed matter physicist and a quantum physicist that works with small things, because this is huge. So this right here is the mu to e experiment. It's being assembled right now. Um, and this experiment, its goal is to observe a muon, which is the cousin of the electron, transform into an electron. And so right now we're gonna show you guys our really large dilution refrigerator. And one of our scientists, his name is Matt Hollister. He's going to be explaining it. We have to see, we have to see where he is right now. So this right here is the heavy assembly building. David, do you mind explaining what that large dilution refrigerator is down there? Sure, uh, I cannot explain it as good as Matt uh, can. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just give you the dimensions first of this thing. What you should be looking at in the screen is uh, the thing that is um, in yellow, um, I call this in English, um, that is sort of had the yellow uh, uh, containment around it, like the yellow bars. So it's a little bit hard to see actually, it's a bit pixelated. So the oh, connection is isn't that, yeah, the connection currently isn't oh, no. that great. Um, but yeah, so inside there, there's a, um, there is actually an old dilution ref or an old um, cryostat. It's not a dilution refrigerator just yet. It's a cryostat, and that cryostat has actually been used already for several decades for different experiments. Yeah, David, we, David we have, have uh, we have Matt, Matt Hollister here. Matt, yeah, who's like Hello. Big, what right. is what is your name? Hi, afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Matt Hollister. I'm head of uh, cryogenics within the SQMS Center. Uh, as David was just saying, uh, the building we're in now is what's known as the Heavy Assembly Building, uh, and it's uh, had a fairly long history. Um, the area that you can see at the moment uh, is going to be home to the future large uh, cryogenic test bed that we're constructing for the SQMS Center. Um, this uh, ultimately will allow us to operate the cavities that you uh, just saw in the uh, in the other lab uh, down to temperatures of around 10 to 20 millikelvin. Uh, but more importantly, this uh, allows us to operate more cavities since we have a much larger cold volume than the current state of the art of refrigerators that are available in other centers. So for this system, we're actually targeting increasing the uh, cold volume uh, available by a factor of about 30, which will allow us to operate many hundreds of the uh, of the very high quality cavities that we uh, 
uh, that you would have seen in the other laboratory. Uh, other interesting features in this building. You want to show the CDF where oh, the yeah. CDF was built? Yeah, I was going to say, let's come on around the other side. And I, was, take another look. I was explaining to our audience that there was some big measurements recently on the W boson. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that's been in the news quite recently. Uh, but this building, when it was originally constructed, uh, is the, the housing for the CDF detector. Uh, you can see just on the other side of the... Uh, the assembly pit here behind the uh, behind those orange uh, shielding blocks. Uh, this is actually where the original CDF detector was located. And I say this has been in the news recently due to some very exciting physics results, which indicate that there probably is some violation of the standard model uh, related to the mass of the W boson. Interesting. And should we show them the Tevatron? Should we go upstairs to show them the, the Tevatron ring? Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, should... yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, what are these big blocks? So we share this building uh, along with SQMS with a number of other experiments. Uh, the blocks that you can see in the pit below us are, are concrete shielding blocks surrounding one of our small test accelerators. Uh, this is a relatively small linear accelerator called A2D2. Uh, this is used uh, as part of the Illinois Accelerator Research Center for development of non-particle physics processes. Mm -hmm. So while Accelerators are great for doing particle physics. It have a lot of other applications in, in everyday life from uh, purification of water, sterilization of medical equipment, even making sure concrete hardens faster and better than it would otherwise. So it's Interesting. Really yeah. exciting. Yeah. Right <laughs> That's really fascinating. <laughs> so Matt, do you mind explaining a little bit about the, the MUTE experiment? I tried explaining that it's, a, it's an experiment to, to watch the heavier cousin of the electron, the muon, transform into the electron, which could indicate new physics beyond the standard model. But Matt, do you, do you mind elaborating a little more and just kind of explaining what is being constructed here? Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is another exciting area that may indicate some violation of the, of the standard model, model of particle physics. Uh, as uh, Maxwell mentioned, the experiment that's being assembled here uh, before it moves to its final home at the other side of the lab is referred to as new to e uh, and this uh, specifically is an experiment that's looking at the uh, decay of muons into electrons. So what you can see on the on the stands here in front of you uh, are parts of the uh, parts of the experiment. Cryostat. Specifically, these are strings of superconducting solenoids. So the cryostat in front, and also a matching cryostat which is parked just behind, wrapped in uh, wrapped in silver foil. Uh, these two components join together to form a large S-shaped cryostat, and these magnets are used to direct the beam of muons uh, through, uh, through a chicane, essentially, before they hit a decay, uh, decay target. Interesting. That's really fascinating. Um, should we show them our... One second, let me turn the camera around. So we have offices here in this building, and we thought it would be, thought it'd be fun to show you guys where we work. Um, and then we can show them the view that shows the Tevatron. Um, is there anything else you think, you know, you think? So we're gonna show you guys where we work. We have, it's a, it's a modern office space. It's a very standard office space, but. How many of us are they? This is one of the struggles of doing a tour in transit is that we, we go through these little, but I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's kind of funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here I don't know go. if you said there anything in the elevator, but of course that wasn't, that we couldn't hear, right? In the elevator, you didn't have reception. Yeah, yeah. So what, what we were saying is it's a pretty standard, um, pretty standard office space. Um, and hold on a second, let's turn this camera around. We are walking through. We're gonna show you guys a view of the Tevatron. Um, so this is where the Fermilab SQMS members work, but SQMS is a collaboration of 23 institutions. And we have like over 300 um, principal investigators. Yes. We have like over 300 That's scientists. Right. And then they, 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 yeah. they are not only scientists, like the people from um, private companies, people from professors from universities are also a part of SQMS. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's a very multifaceted, um, very multifaceted collaboration with experts from, from all sorts of areas, um, like material science, um, physics and sensing, um, computing, yes. um, 
yeah, we so have a, a few engineers around as well. A few engineers <laughs> around as well, <laughs> exactly. So Fermilab and NASA are the um, Fermilab, NASA, Rieti, Lockheed Martin, NIST, and uh, NIST. Yeah, NIST. Um, and then Rutgers University, Northwestern University, are the main. And but I mean, I, I'm 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 sure I'm forgetting about some institutions, but. Uh, we have more institutions to contribute tonight. Yeah, we have a lot of institutions, pretty much. Um, then we're going to show you guys the view from our from our cafeteria, um, just because it's a really great view to see the see the Tevatron, which was which was the world's most powerful particle collider. Then in Geneva, Switzerland, at CERN, um, the Large Hadron Collider, um, you know, the one that uh, the one that discovered the the Higgs boson, that became and then, and then this structure room i can say the most important room in the experience <laughs> yes this is the most <laughs> yeah yeah here's a picture of fermilab this is a the top view like you know an aerial view i guess of fermilab this is our view outside um this big lump right here is the tevatron it's a little hard to see in the distance is wilson hall um but this is where this is where we eat lunch here, here. Let's, uh, let's look at this. So the Wilson Wilson Hall is here. Wilson Hall is here. Mm -hmm. And then the building that we are in are right now here. Exactly. Here. here. And then this is the this is the building that we just showed. The and then we are in the IR building here. And this big ring right here is the Tevatron Collider, which is the data from that collider is what was being analyzed for, for the measuring the, the W boson. Mm -hmm. Um and there's Wilson Hall again. What a great view. It, it, from. I want to say something about, because it looks really empty, right? But the cool part is actually that this is mostly, um, there's, there's a lot of nature there, right? So there's what a lot of wildlife. There's coyotes running around. There's deers running around. There's eagles flying. And as a European, that surprises me a lot. And, and like it is mesmerizing to just sit there and just check out all these animals uh, so close to my, my work, place of work. Exactly, and I believe this is restored prairie. So the Midwest, um, or at least in, in this area of the Midwest, um, there's a lot of prairie. And so this is restored prairie, which is really fascinating to that Fermilab is maintaining the, the local ecosystem. Do you guys have any, any closing remarks? Yes. I forgot the bisons. Oh yeah, we have bison, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so there's a herd of bison here. There's, it's pretty close to, the, to our office area. Um, they're pretty fun to look at. I have I, to say. I, if I remember correctly, there were two baby bisons as of last year, right? Uh, there's yeah. usually 12 to 14 each year, so we're, we're, we're expecting a new crop of babies anytime. Yes. Actually. Do the scientists go crazy when the babies are born? Well, we usually have a running bet as to when the first one will arrive and how many. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so is, is there anything else that we. So, we no, cool. I think that's it, guys. No, um, it was a yeah, we're, Thank yeah so I guess we're. <laughs> we're a new sensor, please please come and visit. We work on tons of interesting things like yeah. Maxwell was talking about physics and sensing to sense, you know, signatures of dark matter. If you're into quantum computing, a lot of us are trying to build a new kind of, of, of qubit based quantum computer. If you're into cold things, ice creams and cryogenics, you can have, have, have a chat to Matt and he'll make you the coldest ice cream ever. The coldest um, ice cream. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, a lot of opportunities for physicists, engineers, all Inter types. Yeah. Like interns, interns. Yes, Max, Max, Max knows a little bit, Max will tell you a little bit more about all the interns yeah, yeah. opportunities. But um, yeah, please come stop by and, and visit us sometime. Yes, the, the lab is open to the public. Um, I don't think the public can go in any of the buildings, but like they can uh, see our- some areas, yeah. You guys can go into some areas, but the whole lab, unfortunately, isn't fully opened. David, do you have any closing remarks? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry, you're muted. Not really, but I do encourage you to, um, yeah, to engage into a summer uh, internship. Those are great. I understand that this is always very good for, also for your career, but also because it's just a lot of fun. And especially now we're ramping up at SQMS, I think we will be able to deliver you a great experience there. So um, that is one thing. Um, and I think I would like to close with that. And also please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at SQMS Center. Um, you have pretty cool social media. I think that's everything. Yes, Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you so much. All right, and thank you so much. We appreciate your time and feel free to send me those handles for your social media afterward. I'm sure I, myself, along with a bunch of other people would love to follow you. I can post those in our Discord channel.
Um, and thank you so much for hosting this event. Uh, it's so like exciting as a student to hear about all of these active areas of research uh, and to get a peek, peek at the wonderful facilities and, and the research culture at Fermilab. So I really appreciate your time today. It was great talking to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.